John Garish and Ellen Chung decided to take their little baby and pet dog on a scenic drive in their Ford Raptor truck. This was on a beautiful Sunday afternoon, specifically on August 15th, 2021. The interesting bit is they ended up parking their truck about a mile and a half away from a rather grim discovery point, which we'll get to shortly, right near the entrance to the Sierra National Forest. This gate is one that leads to Heights Cove based in Jerseydale, Coincidentally, this is also the trailhead for very popular hikes like the Savage Lundy and Heights Cove trails. Now, on the night of August 16th, approximately at 11 p.m., reports surfaced about a family that had suddenly vanished. The alarm was raised by their daughter's caregiver, who discovered that they had not yet returned home. The situation was further escalated by the fact that attempts to get in touch with them by friends and colleagues proved futile. So a spark of worry was lit when John, the father, had failed to report to work on Monday as he normally would. Now the sheriff's office quickly sprang into action on August 17th. During their search mission, they uncovered the couple's vehicle abandoned at the entrance of the Sierra National Forest, a finding that would only heighten the mystery on this subsequent day. Inside the truck were no signs of the family. And so an exploratory team equipped with flashlights and ready for any risky endeavors navigated the rugged and stark terrain that trailed from the site of the vehicle. Within this challenging journey, they discovered distinctive marks that hinted at the presence of this family. Shoe prints corresponding to the family size, coupled with paw prints since they did bring their dog, littered the pathway, offering the faintest glimpse of hope in an otherwise bewildering circumstance. At 3.20 a.m., the local law enforcement agency arranged for a helicopter to assist in the search at first light. Another search group was called upon to start investigating these switchbacks, which create a loop route back to the entrance of the Forest Service. The trail forms a looped path and the south fork of the Merced River marks the middle point of this loop. Nearly at 11 a.m., approximately one and a half miles into these switchbacks, the group stumbles upon the family in the center of the path. John was observed sitting down, the baby and the dog beside him, while Ellen, his wife, was spotted slightly uphill from them. The forecast from the rescuers is that the family was attempting to make their way back to their vehicle and were just wrapping up their hike towards the entrance of the Sierra National Forest. John was discovered with a phone in his pocket, regardless of the scarce cell signal in the zone where the corpses were discovered. Discovered. Detectives promptly proceeded to find out if there were any undelivered text messages or unsuccessful phone call attempts or photographs, as well as GPS location data on the phone. This information was never shared with the press. The family's backpack contained a camelback bladder with a minimal amount of water. It was dispatched for testing to ascertain if there was any contamination. There were no signs to suggest the family had been swimming as they would have turned up dry by the time their bodies were discovered. Now, two deputies actually volunteered to sleep near the family that night to ensure that there would be no tampering with the bodies or the scene until all of it could be airlifted out the following morning via chopper. Now, the sheriff's office was examining several potential causes for the family's tragedy, including hyperthermia, which is extreme heat, poisonous algae, exposure to harmful bacteria, and gaseous emissions from old deserted mines. Despite the soaring temperatures in the region where the family embarked on their hike, which reached a peak of 98 degrees Fahrenheit, it seemed improbable that dehydration was the cause. Given the family pet had also perished and the family's water supply kept in a camelback was not fully exhausted. Just to be clear for those who don't know, hyperthermia is the opposite of hypothermia. To put it simply, hyperthermia is when the body becomes dangerously overheated, usually in response to prolonged exposure to hot and humid weather conditions. 
conditions. The family was located three miles away from an abandoned mine that may contain harmful substances like carbon monoxide, which can develop from decaying organic materials such as wood and during the mineral oxidation process. Yet, could the mine really be a plausible cause considering the distance? Searchers meticulously examined the trail's lower section looking for any unreported mines. However, According to experts, it typically requires direct exposure inside the mine for it to be lethal to the family. Additionally, bacteria bloom samples from the South Fork of the Merced River and Snyder Creek, which are in close proximity to the trail, were collected just to check for any other potential contamination in the area's water. On July 21st, an announcement was made by the Sierra National Forest authorities about a hazardous algae bloom found in the Merced River at Heights Cove. Now, this was after State Fish and Wildlife Department's water quality test revealed high concentrations. So the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency had indicated that algae blooms have the capacity to produce nearly fatal toxins that might harm or kill animals or humans. Sheriff Jeremy Breeze mentioned there are various possibilities in play, such as mine shafts and off-gassing hazards, and we are enhancing our knowledge about the lethal nature of the algae blooms together with our colleagues in our Forest Service and Health Department. Nevertheless, Breeze stated that no no deserted shafts were found nearby. We haven't located any old mine shafts in close proximity. There could be some mine shafts, but the role they play hasn't been determined yet. In the aftermath of the bodies being found, there was no indication of any violent crime or physical harm to the bodies. However, following the usual procedure, the case was classified as a homicide until findings from the coroner's autopsy investigations and toxicology screening were available. Veterinary professionals professionals from the University of California also conducted an examination on Oski, the dog's body. Brees highlighted that his deputy team was doing its best to aid the grief-stricken families of the victims. This is profoundly distressing and emotional. Our focus is on delivering closure and maintaining the safety of our community. This was expressed by Christy Mitchell. She added, Toxic gases, harmful algae blooms, and carbon monoxide released from deserted mines in the vicinity are some of the possible causes being explored by the investigators. At this stage, our investigation isn't concentrated on a single cause. There are countless possibilities that we haven't yet discounted. We've involved factors like lightning strikes, weather conditions, and wildlife in the area. Our investigation is looking at the overall geography of the region. A hazardous situation was declared following the discovery of the bodies, though it was later dismissed. The California State Water Resource Control Board and Mariposa County announced that they are persistently testing the surrounding water bodies for any toxic algae and poison from cyanobacteria. The Agency for Public Health in California said it was unaware of any fatalities due to the exposure of this toxin from leisure or drinking water, although some animals have been reportedly killed by algae. The autopsies of the deceased were finalized on Thursday, August 19th, and none of the bodies displayed signs of physical injuries like bullet wounds or indications of any trauma, and there were no trace of a suicide note. Now, according to Christy Mitchell, this creates a highly unusual and perplexing situation. She believes that due to the lack of straightforward evidence, this case may require extensive and meticulous investigation. The Sheriff's Department confirmed that neither weaponry nor chemical threats contributed to the fatalities on the Savage Lundy Path on August 26th. However, they left open all other possible factors leading to the deaths. Two days later, on August 28th, the Sierra National Forest authorities ordered the closing of the Merced River Recreation Area because of hidden dangers discovered around the Savage Lundy Path. The closure under Forest Order Number 05-15-51-21-18 was effective from August 29th, set to last until September 26th or earlier if the circumstances around the area improved. Now, due to the uncontrollable wildfires, the USDA Forest Service decided to prohibit public entry into all 20 million acres of California's National Forest from August 31st, 2021. 
This closure in effect for a fortnight was expected to last until at least September 17th. Now fast forward to September 30th, 2021, and the county actually released some decent information that the causes of death were not the case of firearms or any other weapons, lightning strikes, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, cyanide poisoning, illegal substances, alcohol, or suicide. And in a media briefing held on October 21st, 2021, it was officially officially stated by the county sheriff's department that hyperthermia coupled with probable dehydration was the cause of the Garish family's death. Even their pet canine Oski succumbed from heat-related complications. Sheriff Jeremy Brees stated the rarity of such an incident, comparing it to his work experience spanning two decades. He says this, In Mariposa County, this is uncommon. In my 20 years here, I have not seen a case of death by hyperthermia before. Listen, anytime you're dealing with an entire family, especially with an infant included in a tragedy, it's really never easy to cover. Cover, and I sincerely hope that by covering this, more families will be aware of the potential dangers of not being adequately prepared to go on long treks in the outdoors. So would you please comment down below right now, love and respect to the Garish family. Well, what happened is completely tragic. My question is why did it take them this long to come to the conclusion that it was hyperthermia? Now, I'm also speaking from a place of honest ignorance because I'm not a coroner, so I don't know the process, but it just comes off to me like they weren't sure what the actual death was and that was the best they could possibly conclude. I mean, they even mentioned multiple times that the death was strange. So is it possible that there were other things at play here? And in fact, this is really nothing new because there are other hikers who are found under distressing or bizarre circumstances and have also been concluded in this similar manner. Now, before I get into more of those, there was a hiker who also was hiking in the Sierra National Forest when he encountered something truly strange that he cannot explain. He was apparently lost for around 24 hours and returned under bizarre circumstances circumstances. This was back in the 1980s. Now, like many others hiking the Sierra National Forest, Joey was a very experienced hiker and woodsman. And on this day in late June or early July of 1984, he was tracking the College Rock Trailhead. From my understanding, College Rock is actually one of the highest in elevation in the National Forest. I think somewhere around 9,000 feet, if I'm correct. And Joey recalls that at some point during this roughly five mile trek in the Kaiser World, wilderness, he became randomly and suddenly extremely disoriented and actually had to sit down. At first, he assumed it was from a lack of hydration, but he had been chugging water like no one's business. He began to feel extremely dizzy. And to note, there was also nobody else on the trail near him or around him at this time. And it was roughly about 2 or 3 p.m. in the afternoon, perfect weather conditions as well. And then Joey describes this bright, blinding light consuming him, as he describes, and the next thing he remembers is waking up near the very beginning of the trailhead, right near the parking lot where search and rescue had discovered him. The kicker here is that he was wearing a completely different outfit than when he had been when he left initially. His backpack and supplies were nowhere to be found, and the clothing he was found in were white robes. Upon questioning Joey, he had no idea what had happened or how much time had transpired, and so he explained to authorities exactly what had taken taken place and what he was doing. Joey, for lack of a better words, was very straight edged to not consume any substances or alcohol. And even if he had, it would not explain him being found at the beginning of the trailhead when search and rescue had already looked there. And then you have him wearing completely different clothing. It just didn't really make a whole lot of sense. Either way, Joey's story is extremely strange. Now, this other search and rescue officer recounted some very bizarre things in their time at the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Disappearing cases are quite common on the job, constituting around half of the calls I get, while the rest tend to involve accidents or animal encounters. One specific incident that occurs to me involves an elderly lady who we lost track of during fall. The track that she took was quite straightforward, making her disappearance all the more puzzling. We found a clue to her whereabouts when we discovered her walking stick hanging from a branch around 70 feet off the the ground. It was very unusual given that it was above a dense thicket 
and she was physically incapable of scaling such a height. When we eventually found her after almost two days, she was in a daze with no clear recollection of any relevant events. She did mention encountering a tall, hairy wild man, but brushed it off as a dream. In another instance, a fellow officer and I responded to a call from a distressed hiker near the Klingman's Dome. The man had been out photographing the scenery in the early winter morning. We could sense the panic in his voice, but could not understand the cause from his frantic explanations. As we reached him, we found him atop a boulder crying, camera in one hand and its smashed lens in the other. He was completely inconsolable, stuck in an uncontrollable fit of sobbing and convulsions. We climbed up to him. His viewfinder held an image of the landscape below, but there were strange distortions in the image. Figures appearing in the clear morning scene, their forms blurred and shifting, not unlike the shapes you see when squinting. Seeing it, we both felt in the pit of our stomachs that something was wrong, accompanied by a pressure drop that caused tremendous discomfort in our ears. We quickly brought the fellow down from the boulder and called in for a medevac, assuming he was having a heart attack. The image was later lost when we attempted to transfer it from the camera's internal memory, leaving only a corrupted file behind. And of course, there was a young girl who seemed to simply vanish from the Sugarlands Visitor Center during an early spring art fair. She had been playing near a small creek, wearing a distinct bright yellow dress that could be spotted from quite a distance. Her disappearance sparked a massive search that saw law enforcement, locals, and even our business staff joining in to assist. Just days into the search she was found, but nine miles away in the Cades Cove area, somehow clean and completely unharmed. She claimed a friendly deer woman had led her there. When asked further about the friendly deer woman, she couldn't explain more for some reason. Normally, you would just brush this off as a child's wild imagination, but when you look at the staggering amount of similar sightings and circumstances with other missing and found children in national parks nearly describing the same thing, there's something very wrong. Of course, we are yet to find conclusive proof of anything outlandish, but the patterns here are unmistakable. Sometimes reality seems more bizarre than we can fathom. Now, what I find very interesting about that particular set of stories is that the elderly lady in the first account describes being taken by hairy wild men, which sounds very similar to what many describe Bigfoot being. Now, it's no secret that there are a plethora of Bigfoot-like beings living and existing in our national parks and forests. You don't have to look very far to find them. In fact, even in a lot of David Politis' missing 411 work, he even talks about how the strange phenomenon is and the fact that many hikers, especially young children, have alluded to seeing what they refer to as a bear man, or to put it more simply, being taken by a large hairy man. The whole thing is extremely strange, and this next set of stories details a little bit more of what could potentially be a run-in with one of these beings. In 2015, a group of friends completed a day of hiking in the Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont. They made camp nearby and spent the evening playing ukulele around the campfire. Unexpectedly, they heard a high-pitched wailing from somewhere outside the firelight. The evening was cold, but there was no snow. The group discussed what could make such a noise with none of them coming up with any sort of rational conclusion. One member of the group grew up in rural Vermont and is very familiar with the sounds of nature, but this was something completely different. They dismissed the idea of it being a moose or a bear because the sound reminded them of the Bigfoot howls they would hear in TV documentaries. But of course, because it sounded so ridiculous, the idea was dismissed altogether. They extinguished the fire and went to sleep in their tents. Now, the following day, they left to return to the car and drove to a nearby bar. And as they're heading out for drinks, they saw this battered up pickup truck approaching them where they actually stopped and asked directions. Now, as they stopped the driver, who was this older man who happened to be a carpenter, he began warning them about wild animals in the area and mentioned a creature 
called the Howler. Fast forward that night when the men returned back to their camp, they heard that same frightening scream yet again. And so they made a decision that come morning light, they're going to explore to see if they can find anything. And so come the following morning during the daylight, with the sun warming up the environment, they found tracks in the snow. None of the tracks matched any animal they knew, except for one set. The tracks were big and resembled a human's footprint, but were larger, measuring about 16 inches in length. They recalled the carpenter's words about the howler, which disturbed them. So they went back to a couple of the bars they usually frequent and shared their encounter story with a few friends and acquaintances at the bar and actually received several very serious responses. One from a retired law enforcement officer who told them about similar instances in the area around White River. A large expanse of mountains in the area would be a likely location for a being such as this. Later, these men would actually research Howler stories, comparing them to their own experience, and they say these similarities were unmistakable. Now, in April of 2017, a man would embark on a journey to walk the entire Appalachian Trail, a daunting feat totaling 2,200 miles. Starting in New York, he planned to venture through the Florida's Key West via the Florida Trail. Along the trail, he adopted the nicknames Denim and Mostly Harm originating from his proclaimed favorite book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Throughout his journey, he was met with various invitations from locals residing along the trail. They would offer him the comforts of home, including shelter, showers, and laundry facilities. But mostly, he just preferred to keep to himself, often turning down these offers. But he wasn't always reserved. On occasion, he would engage in social activities and was known for his rather approachable demeanor. Hikers' hostels were a common feature in his journey, making an exception to his solitary preference. Despite his friendliness, people he encountered knew very little about him, which contributed to an ironic sense of mystery. While many hikers take on the Appalachian Trail each and every year, this man's journey wound up as an unsolved mystery. To date, nobody really knows his real identity. His journey still remains shrouded in mystery. On July 23rd, 2018, two hikers, Nicholas Horton and Logan Buell, were in the Big Cypress National Preserve down in Florida, and they were passing through an area known as Noble's Camp. They stumbled upon what appeared to be an abandoned tent. Now, upon closer inspection, the two men made a shocking discovery. Inside the tent was the dead body of a man. According to eyewitness accounts, his body was in a twisted form with eyes wide open as if staring straight at them. A closer assessment of the corpse would suggest that he was a male between the ages of 35 to 50. Notable physical features included a beard and a clearly malnourished gaunt appearance. In the immediate vicinity of the body, the hikers found several items. Among these were hiking gear and a backpack indicating that the deceased was likely another hiker. A significant sum of cash amounting to over $3,500, specifically $3,640, was found in the tent. However, the more intriguing finds were two notebooks chock full of varied writings. These writings ranged from personal diary entries to notes on computer coding. Also included were recipes specifically for trail mix and protein bars. Now, despite these findings, the identity of the man remained a mystery. There was nothing in the abandoned tent that could hint at his identity. There was no phone or any form of identification, like a license or a passport or even a credit card. The notebooks did not contain any personal details that could help with identification. Authorities were alerted by hikers who discovered the emaciated and deceased body of a man. The man weighed just 83 pounds and appeared to have starved to death. Despite there being local homes outposts along the route, and ample money on his person to purchase food. Now, in an attempt to identify the corpse, the man's fingerprints were taken. However, no matches were found after the fingerprints were checked within the national databases. Missing person reports were also checked, but again, no matches were revealed for the region. Following these unsuccessful attempts to identify him, a DNA sample was then collected and sent for analyzation to the 
University of Northern Texas. When compared against national databases, this too produced zero results. The authorities then resulted to creating a composite sketch of the man in hopes of someone recognizing him. This sketch was circulated widely. It was only then that a person came forward to identify the unidentified hiker. A woman, Kelly Fairbanks, who lived along the Florida Trail, recognized the sketch. Fairbanks confirmed that the man was indeed a hiker and went by the alias Mostly Harmless. She further said that she had spent time with him while he was hiking. Despite Fairbanks' information, the man's real identity and the reason for his untimely demise remained a mystery. He told me he started in New York and he was headed to Key West and I thought he must be doing okay because he made it this far. It is pretty unusual for a through hiker not to carry a cell phone. He's probably the only one I've ever met personally that didn't have a cell phone. He just seemed like a super nice person. He had such kind eyes. To go through the trail blind was naive. I thought that was a bad decision. We just wished him happy trails and sent him on his way. He died doing something he loved. Now, despite several clear pictures of him during his trip, his real identity remained unknown. There were no relatives or acquaintances who could confirm his identity. No one knew where he came from as he had no distinct regional accent and he hadn't disclosed this information to other hikers he met on the trail. Fairbanks, one of the hikers on the trail, was one of the few who interacted with Mostly Harmless. She noticed that he seemed unprepared for the journey, lacking a phone or GPS device. However, since he managed to traverse all the way from New York, she didn't really worry about him initially. Despite her offer for him to refresh and gather supplies in her home, he simply declined. In an attempt to identify this mysterious hiker, there were investigations into this movement. It was discovered that he checked into the top of Georgia Hostel and Hiking Center under the name Ben Bellamy. Unfortunately, this would be a dead end in the investigation as the name turned out to be a simple pseudonym. Several hikers also came forward with accounts of their meetings with Mostly Harmless, which further led to the conclusion that he was the unidentified dead hiker. A faint hint appeared when one of the hikers claimed that Mostly Harmless mentioned working in the tech industry. However, it was still insufficient to figure out who he was. The police were left puzzled by this mystery. First, let's discuss the known aspects. Mostly Harmless was a hiker whose real identity remains unrevealed. He was a friendly man who often took pictures of himself and interacted with many people along his hiking journey. His popularity, however, didn't reveal the unexpected fate he was to face. While he was on the trail, his unique and approachable personality resulted in multiple photographs being taken of him. Witnesses, as well as those in pictures, showed him as a robust and healthy individual. He was neither suffering from any terminal illnesses nor displayed any signs of health concerns. The mystery deepens when considering the circumstances of his sudden death. He was found dead in his tent, and curiously, his health condition had significantly deteriorated by then. His weight had drastically reduced, contrary to his appearance in the images taken not long before his death. Despite conducting a medical examination, the cause of his death couldn't be determined, making it even more of a mystery. While the exam confirmed his drastic weight loss and his otherwise perfect health condition, it failed to provide reasonable answers for his sudden demise. In conclusion, Mostly Harmless's death raises a multitude of questions that still remain unanswered. The circumstances surrounding his death, his perfect health status, and the unexpected weight loss all contribute making this case an unsolved enigma. The question that lingers is, what exactly happened to Mostly Harmless? Speculation suggests that the man known as Mostly Harmless possibly hailed from the New York area, as this is where he originally embarked on his journey. It is also believed that he was employed within the tech industry, likely performing some type of coding work. However, this information remains conjecture in the absence of actual concrete evidence. Now, strikingly, none of those acquainted with him, his friends or family, if any, under his actual name have identified him despite his image being widely distributed across social media. Because where he was found is very frequented by travelers and hikers alike and is full of establishments like hostels and homes, these places could have easily extended help or offered him provisions. 
adding to this puzzling fact that he was found with over three grand in his possession, it just seems to me implausible that he starved out there on his own. His story still remains riddled with unsolved questions. It had been a few months since I had transitioned from a volunteer to a dedicated search and rescue officer and this was one of my first high stakes situations. Unlike the familiar routine of looking for lost hikers, which mostly involved checking maps and GPS coordinates, this one had me braving the Alaskan wilderness in the winter, with temperatures dropping well below freezing. The incident in question happened on the 19th of January in 2016, at a snow-covered campsite deep into the park, only accessible by snow machine. There were four of us, assigned this mission by the Denali National Park Service after receiving an SOS call late in the evening from a group of campers. They reported a massive creature had been circling their camp, which had notably caused significant damage already. By the time we arrived, the campers were huddled together inside one of the tents. They were taken to safety while we were left to inspect the empty campsite. All the while, we could hear faint and distinct noises that sounded human from the surrounding woods. As we ventured deeper to investigate, we reported seeing brief flashes of what looked like human figures in our headlamp beams. The closer we got, the more frantic the movements became, all before disappearing suddenly into the darkness. We then came across my first set of these mysterious tracks. They were massive, 18 and 19 inches long and 10 inches wide, unlike any animal we'd ever encountered in these parts. They were also bipedal. There must have been at least 12 or more of these things leading up to a steep hill, and it seemed like they were not recent ones as the persistent Alaska cold had iced them. We carefully followed the tracks to what appeared to be a hidden cave where we would discover remnants of torn sleeping bags, backpacks, and scattered camping gear. No human remains, fortunately. Despite the chilling ambiance, the only remarkable observation was a deep bone-rattling howl that we heard echoing through the mountains. The entire episode lasted about five nights and despite our best efforts, we failed to identify or spot what this seemed to be. On the third night, however, my colleague, who I'll call Max, discovered that one of the snowmobiles was badly damaged. The left suspension of our team's snowmobile was bent oddly, and it appeared to be a result of a direct, forceful blow, rather than a crash or accident. This only made things all the more strange. We did report this to the higher-ups, but after some time had passed, I'm forced to admit that something unexplainable, possibly monstrous, does lurk in the woods. This event has deeply affected me and my team, but only time will tell what happened. Look guys, I just want to make a note here that since there are cases in this video that do cover tragedy and the loss of human life, it's important to do so with respect and love to those missing and their families who were affected. And in so making this video and videos like this, my hope is to not bring disrespect, but bring awareness to other families and hikers of the potential dangers, whether it be environmental, animal, or other in the outdoors and our national parks. Now, on a much deeper personal level, my heart does go out to every single person watching this who's ever been affected by a missing person's case, whether it be in the woods or not. Now, since you guys didn't make it this far into the video, I want you to comment again down below respect the woods. Unfortunately, the many hikers out there who didn't get a chance to come back to their families don't get that opportunity, but they will never be forgotten. If you've experienced anything similar or you've been affected by a missing individual, know that you're loved, your pain is valid, and let's bring awareness to these things. As always, I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll see you guys in the very next episode.